Welcome to St. Andrew the Great this Sunday morning. It's really great to be able to meet together uh, as uh, the Lord's people, whether that here, be here in the building or for you uh, at home as well. It is a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? A particular welcome if you are new with us, whether that be at home, uh, you're, you've just moved to Cambridge and you're watching into the live stream, or whether you're new and able to join us here in the building uh, this morning, whether you be a new international or a new student at Anglia Rustin or uh, Cambridge University, it is really, really good to have you with us this morning. We're going to be beginning a new series uh, this morning as we go through this autumn term. We're going to be uh, looking together at the opening chapters of Matthew's Gospel. This morning we're going to be thinking about Jesus' lineage, his, his, church, his, fa- um, his, his family history. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 and 5 picks up that theme. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. At just the right time in God's faithfulness, he sent his son into the world to keep and fulfill all the promises that God had made. It speaks, doesn't it, of God's faithfulness, of his steadfast covenant love towards his people. And we're going to sing of those things in our opening song of God's... uh, So we're going to sing being thankful for his faithfulness and for his love in Jesus. So let's sing together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise. sit down. You can't really miss the point of that song, can you? God is faithful, God is strong, God is with us, and his love endures forever. Wonderful truths to remind one one another of on this wet Sunday morning when we don't really know what tomorrow holds. 
My name's Ruth Oakley, and I'd like to add my welcome to that of James this morning. It's good to see those of you who are in the church building, and great to know that many others are at home now, too, watching this at home. We're going to spend some time now talking to God, the God we've been singing about. And Caroline Steer, who's one of our women's early morning Bible study leaders, is going to lead us in that. Yes, the Lord is faithful, but we are faithless. Throughout this week, we have not loved God with our whole hearts. We have put other things before him. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. How selfish we have been grabbing, not giving. Yet, God's generous, unlimited love endures forever. And through his son, Jesus, we can come before him to repent of our wrong. Please take a moment to read through the prayer of confession on the screen. Let us say together, O King, enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness, we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here is a word of reassurance from Paul's letter to the Romans. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for your faithfulness and your forgiveness Thank you for Jesus' finished work at the cross, our unfailing and indestructible hope. Thank you, Father, for your spirit given to your children. Help us in our weakness to pray, to speak boldly of the risen Christ to those around us, and to wait patiently for Jesus' return. Thank you, Lord, for the freedoms we have as a church family in this country. Keep us united. And we ask you to uphold Christian brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted for their faith in Jesus. We remember especially vulnerable believers suffering in North Korea and war-torn Syria, needing food, aid, and medical support as the pandemic worsens. Lord, have mercy. May your kingdom come and your will be done in a world broken by sin. We now pray for mission partners, Paul and Beamin Holland, leading the Gateway Church in East Jurong, Singapore. Almighty God, we give thanks that almost all the Gateway Church family are meeting together in person now, with many non-Christian guests and visitors coming along too. Please give Paul and Beamin wisdom in knowing how best to share Jesus and serve the church family, living by the spirit and putting to death the misdeeds of the body. We pray especially for the clear planning of a Christmas series of gospel events. A year since public services began, we pray for the faithful proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ so that many people hear and believe. Heavenly Father, our ever-present help in trouble, our fortress 
and our God. Calm the anxious fears of all who turn to you. Give strength and healing to those who are sick and courage and skill to those who care for them. May officials in authority be just and righteous towards the oppressed and humble us all to call upon you that we may be saved, not only in this life, but also for that which is to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, children particularly. Uh, this bit is for you, so if you're at home, why don't you come a bit closer to the TV, and if you're here, stay where you are. Uh, my name's James, uh, and this morning we're going to be thinking about what kind of relationship do Christians have with Jesus? Um, are Christians like Jesus' distant cousins? Uh, family, but not close family. Well, no, it's much better than that. Okay, are Christians like Jesus' next-door neighbours, someone that you know but not very well? Well, no, it's much better than that. Uh, are Christians like Jesus' pet? Well, no, it's much better than that too. Uh, so what kind of relationship do Christians have with Jesus? Uh, well, the Bible says that Christians are Jesus' bride. Uh, let's have a look at what the Bible says. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Uh, the church, Christians, are Jesus' bride, not a distant cousin, not a next door neighbor, not a pet, but a bride, the closest of relationships and dearly loved. That's much better, isn't it, than being a, a pet or a cousin or a neighbor. Uh, the church, Christians, are Jesus's bride. Um, I got married on this very spot about two years ago. That's a picture of my bride, Catherine. And on the day we got married, uh, we made promises to each other that we'd stay married to each other. Uh, we started living together from that day. And we have the closest of relationships. And that is what the church, what God's people uh, will enjoy with Jesus, the closest of relationships, not a pet, not a cousin, not a next-door neighbor, uh, and living with him forever. Uh, isn't it brilliant that God's people, the church, are Jesus' bride, dearly loved, and the closest relationship? Um, if you're in the building, have a look around the room uh, and look at other people here. If you're at home, have a look at the other people on the sofa. If you're looking at someone who trusts in Jesus... Uh, then you're looking at one of the people that God has chosen to be his bride. Um, and if you trust in Jesus yourself, if you're following him, uh, then you will live forever as part of the church, as his bride, um, with him forever. Uh, should we give thanks to God? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for choosing a people to be Jesus' bride. Thank you for how much you love us. And thank you that one day we will live with Jesus forever in the closest relationship. Amen. Uh, well, guys, the next thing is if you are an explorer, if you've signed up for explorers, uh, why don't you head up to your group. Um, the cook room is where you're headed, which is uh, two floors up and in the middle. And please could you use the kitchen stairs, so that corner uh, back right uh, for you. Yeah, there you go. Kitchen corner for explorers. Thank you. Um, and the, the next thing that we're going to do as the explorers are heading up is we're going to sing together. And our next song is about how God has been faithful to his people all through time. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we sing? Noah built the most enormous boat that kept the birds and animals afloat. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Noah lived his life for him. Moses led his people through the sea, taking them away from slavery. 
The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Moses lived his life for him. Oh, thank you, oh, thank you, that all through history you were faithful. Thank you, oh, thank you, that you are just the same when it comes to me. When it comes to me. Humble shepherd boy became a king. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and David lived his life for him. Daniel was inside a lion's den, but God brought him to safety once again. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Daniel lived his life for him. Time to take away our sin So we could get to know our God again The Lord is good, the Lord is strong And we will live our lives for Him Oh, thank you, oh, thank you That all through history you were faithful Thank you, oh, thank you That you are just the same Just the same when it comes to me 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 Do sit down again. It's time now for climbers and adventurers to leave for their group in the Baines Perkins room. So if parents could take them, please, up through the door um, over there by the kitchen. And then if the parents could come down, there's a one-way system, so if you can come down the other stairs, that would be great. And while they're leaving, we'll have a few notices. If you're new here today, we're really glad you could join us. Do please come and say hello afterwards, either to myself or one of the other members of staff. Uh, there's several other ways you can get to know us, too. If you're watching online, you can join us by, uh, at afterchurchcoffee.com, where you'll be, if you just put that into your browser, um, you'll meet a few members of the church family. We'll be put in small groups, and you can chat to other people from the church family and get to know a bit more about us. You can also sign up online with your details at stag.org new, or use the QR codes which are around the church, um, and someone will get in touch with you. And if you'd like to come to church in person next week, then please could you sign up by Wednesday midnight, that's slightly earlier than it has been, to give our office a chance to sort out details um, and get back to people to tell them they can come. Um, a programme card of services for the next few months is now available. Um, you'll find them at the doors as you leave, so do take one and do take one for a friend as well. It gives you all the details of the sermon series and the services in the next few months. The next notice is really just for um, regular members, those who are on our electoral roll. If you're a visitor, please bear with us. On the 13th of October, we're going to have our annual pastoral church meeting, our APCM as it's called, which was postponed from April. This was going to be online and it'll be a short formal meeting uh, with a chance to elect new church wardens, PCC members and members of the Deanery Synod. And it'll be followed by our monthly prayer meeting um, if you'd like to nominate anyone, there are sign-up sheets available um, over there on the wall by the bookstall, so do sign up uh, people you think would be appropriate. Uh, and if, also, if you're on the electoral roll, you will be sent details of how to join that meeting just beforehand. And finally, if you're here as a postgraduate, uh, we'd love to get to know you too, and you're invited to a welcome evening on the 11th of October. Uh, you can sign up for that at stag.org postgrads. 
and you'll be put in a group of six and then go out to dinner with other people physically. So it's a physical meeting, but do sign up for that. It's a great chance to get to know other postgrads in Cambridge. If you've got a Bible near you, now's the time to grab it as we're going to read God's word together and think about what he wants to say to us today. And before Alistair comes to help us in that, Stephen is going to lead us um, in reading it. We have three passages that we're going to read this morning, and the first is Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Before I read it, shall we just pray? Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our heart. Please help us to concentrate as, this, as your word is read and to what Alistair has to say about it. And we pray for Alistair that you will give him the right words faithfully to expound it. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, page 13 of the Church Bibles. 2,000 years before Christ, God makes a great set of promises to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Our second passage is 1 Chronicles 17, verses 10 to 14, which can be found on page 421 of the Church Bibles. I'll give you a moment to find that passage. A thousand years before Christ, God tells the prophet Nathan to make a great promise to David. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him, as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. And our third passage is the very beginning of the New Testament, Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17, which can be found on page 965 of the Church Bibles. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. 
After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Elihud, Elihud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Well, Stephen, thank you very much indeed for reading that. Aren't you glad, uh, looking around, that you weren't asked to read that particular passage of, of names? Uh, good morning, and good morning also to those of you who are watching on the live stream from at home. I know that includes a number of you who've been so keen to get here and haven't been able to, we haven't been able to fit you in yet, and I just want to say we're working hard uh, to try to do what we can to increase the capacity. Well, please have open in front of you Matthew chapter 1 and the passage which Stephen read. It is said to writers that the first few lines of a book are vital. The reader is in the shop or perhaps looking at something online, and you need to engage their attention. Otherwise, they'll put the book back in the shelf or, or turn to a different page. Now imagine you're writing an introduction to Christianity. How do you start? How do you grab the reader's attention? Well, this is what Matthew does to start his gospel. And it does seem most extraordinary, doesn't it? A great dry genealogy. Some of you might find this interesting. You might be avid watchers of who do you think you are, or you use Ancestry.com to track back your ancestry all the way back to uh, um, Herod the Wake or somebody if you come from Ely. But for many people, this seems a bizarre and pointless way to start uh, an introduction to Christianity. So I'd better explain why we're doing it. Our plan is for the autumn to read through Matthew's Gospel together. And our method as a church, uh, old hands will be familiar with this, <coughs> is we try to read the Bible as it's been given to us and not to skip bits out. And that's why we're doing this. If Matthew starts this way, he must have a good reason for including it. And he does. He wants us to know that the carpenter from Nazareth who changed the world has an enormous backstory. Matthew wants us to know that if we want to understand Jesus properly, we don't start with the stable in Bethlehem. We don't even start, like some biographies do, with his parents or his grandparents and the influences that shaped him. No, we have to start 2,000 years before Jesus. And he takes us in this genealogy on a fast forward uh, through Old Testament history with two very unlikely promises which find their fulfillment in Jesus. Matthew takes us right back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. We need to understand him and then King David if we're going to understand Jesus. So here goes with a fast forward. Verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We meet Abraham in the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis, as you'll know, begins by telling us that God, the almighty creator, made the universe and this world and us to live in it under his rule. But it also tells us the tragic story of human rebellion against God and how, as a result of that, we've become separated from our own maker. That's the greatest problem that humanity has that we're separated from our own maker. But then the story, the true story continues with this man, Abraham. He's a man living in what now we call Syria, about 2,000 years before Christ. We're never told why 
God picks him out. No explanation is given. But what we are told is that God makes to Abraham an extraordinary set of promises. They're the ones that Stephen read to us. Genesis chapter 12, you've got a Bible open in front of you, the church Bibles, it's page 13. The Lord had said to Abram, which is what he was called then, go from your country, your people in your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So God promises to make from this one man a great nation. And more than that, he promises to live in a special relationship with him. I will bless you. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. In other words, I will be specially on your side. Now that's uh, a remarkable thing because uh, it's showing the beginning of bringing people back into relationship with God. We'd become separated from God But now God is entering into a special relationship of closeness with Abraham and the great nation that's going to come from him, his descendants. But more than that, there's a breathtaking finish to this set of promises. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God promises Abraham right at the beginning of the Bible that it's through his line and his descendants, the great nation that's going to come from him, that the basic problem of humanity is going to be fixed. People all over the world, peoples all across the world, are going to be brought back into this relationship of blessing with God. It is an amazing promise. 2,000 years before Jesus, 4,000 years before us now. And so naturally, from this point in the Bible onwards, the big question is, well, how is this going to happen? Back to Matthew chapter 1. And we track down through the generations. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, who was also known as Israel, the father of Judah and his brothers. This is the beginning of the nation of Israel. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. And so it goes down. And during the lives of the people in this paragraph, the nation, uh, Abraham's descendants, did indeed expand to be the great nation of Israel. During the lives of the people in this paragraph, they were dramatically rescued by God from captivity in Egypt and brought to the land that God promised them, the promised land. All these things happened during this uh, first paragraph here in Matthew's Gospel. So far, so good. A great nation has been formed, but still the question is, how is blessing going to come to the whole world? Well, then we pick it up in verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, the Ruth we read about in the Bible. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. Abraham is one great individual in this list, and David is the other. And he is singled out because, just like Abraham before him, God makes to him a very great promise. It turns out that God's people have been living in the special land that God's given them, but they need permanent leadership. The leadership's been very patchy. So God chooses David from the line of Judah, calling him a man after his own heart to be king. And after he's been king for a bit, he makes to David the most extraordinary promise. Your house, that's not your... uh, physical house but your dynasty as we would say we say the house of Windsor and your kingdom shall endure forever before me your throne shall be established forever God promised Abraham that from him would come blessing to the whole world this restoration of relationship between people and God he promises to Abraham's descendant David that the kingdom which is established in him and which will come from him down his line, will last forever. 
And of course, there's nothing like that in human history of any kind. Other dynasties come and go. The Caesars came and went. The Habsburgs of Austria came and went. The Romanovs of Russia came and went. And we think, well, how could this be possible for a kingly line to last forever and ever and ever? And we're also, we also, still at this point in the story, don't have the answer to the question, well, how is blessing going to come for the, to the world? So two promises which must have seemed so unlikely from this little nation blessing to the whole world and a, and a, a, a kingdom that would last forever. Well, we follow it on in Matthew chapter 1. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. And so it goes on. The line continues uh, from David onwards, and this time it's a line of kings. All the people in this middle paragraph are kings. This is a line of royal succession. Now, if you find these things uh, interesting and perhaps you're um, a bit of a Bible beaver and you read the Gospel of Luke and you wonder how this meshes together with the Lord Jesus' genealogy in Luke, we won't get into this now, but I posted something about that on the, uh, the church website under the heading of this week's blog. So you can follow that up uh, at some stage while you have your coffee after Sunday lunch. But this is the line from David. And at first, it does indeed look as if God will have a permanent kingdom. Down and down it goes to the generations. Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Uzziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. So it goes down the royal line of succession. Was God's promised blessing for all nations maybe going to come through this family in some way? Would this line really go on forever? Well, then it seems to go horribly wrong. Verse 10, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amon, Amon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. David is king. God makes this promise of a permanent kingdom to him and so the, the, the line carries on and on and on down the generations. But then these kings turn from God and in judgment upon them, he has the city, the capital city of Jerusalem, sacked by the Babylonians and the people carried away into exile in faraway Babylon. And even 70 years later, after some of them have returned, there is from that point on no king in charge uh, in David's line of the people of Israel. There is none. They're ruled by foreign powers, first the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, but somebody else is always in charge. And as you look at the third paragraph after the exile to Babylon, if you and I had been living then, we would have been tempted to think God's great promises have failed. There's no sign of the blessing to the whole world that's going to come through Abraham's line. They're just a, a feeble little lot of people living under foreign occupation. What's happened to the promise of this permanent kingdom? The kingdom's been destroyed. It must have been a real head-scratching question. We know it was because that question is raised several times in the Old Testament. And we might well have thought that God's promises had failed. And yet, in that third paragraph, there is still a line of descent. There are still heirs to the throne. They may not be king, but going down through the generations, uh, Jeconiah is the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. He is somebody we've heard of. He was a leader. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. After that, we have no information from the Old Testament about the people on this list, but there's still a line of descent, as if to say, maybe God is still going to keep his promise. The prophets certainly said so. This is what Isaiah said. Centuries and centuries before Christ. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. 
Oh, how's this going to be possible, Isaiah might have thought. Answer, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Through those days, when the nation was small and there seemed to be, there was no king, there seemed to be no sign of blessing to the world, the faithful few held on to promises like that. And they had a title for this great king who was prophesied. They called him the Messiah. In Greek, it's the Christ. The only question was, who would he be and when would he come? See, they believed in the faithfulness of God. They knew that when God makes a promise, the God of the Bible makes a promise, he never, ever fails to fulfill it. And so they were waiting and waiting. Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Jesus is the promised king. Chapter 1, verse 1 again. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And now we see why we start the gospel with what looks like this dry genealogy. Jesus is the son of Abraham through whom all nations on earth will be blessed. There is a phenomenon isn't there, of people all over the world meeting Sunday by Sunday in countless different countries from different cultures who've come to know God personally through Jesus. Some of us are here today, many more are out there in your rooms. We're longing for the day we can get back together and see each other again here in the building itself like a miniature version of the United Nations but so much nicer. People like us from Europe or Asia or Africa or South America or North America, people who've not had a Jewish ancestry are now in fellowship with God because of Jesus Christ. At the time that God made that promise to Abraham, it must have seemed incredibly unlikely and certainly he had no sight of how that was going to be fulfilled. But Matthew's telling us that Jesus is the one who has brought this about. And to apply this personally, that does mean that people like you and me, who have no natural connection with uh, Israel, can be brought into fellowship with God through Jesus. There's actually, there's a hint of it here in the genealogy. Did you notice there are some women who are included? Tamar and Rahab and Ruth, and although she's not named, Bathsheba. It seems likely that three or possibly four of those women were foreigners. And they've partly been included uh, to show that God's plan had always been to reach the world through his uh, promised king. Jesus is the son of Abraham. He's the one through whom this blessing to the world comes. And Jesus is the son of David, fulfilling the promise of the permanent kingdom. He is from David's royal line. When the Magi arrived, and we're going to be hearing from them in a couple of weeks' time, they arrive in Bethlehem, well, in fact, first of all in Jerusalem, and say, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? He fits the promise, and he reigns forever and ever and ever. If one extraordinary phenomenon about the Christian church is its international scope, another extraordinary phenomenon about the Christian church is the fact that it cannot be extinguished. If you read church history, even just the book of Acts, uh, it, which is the first book of church history in the Bible, you will see there have been numerous threats uh, to the Christian church over the years. There's been persecution, false teaching, all kinds of troubles, and still they're kept and they're kept because they have a king standing behind them who rules forever. We had uh, my wife Rachel's uh, birthday recently, and we put uh, a few of those rather mean candles on the cake uh, where you blow them as hard as you like. I don't know what, whether you're allowed to blow birthday cakes, I'm now thinking, but anyway, we did. We're all in the same household. So you blow them, and 
uh, you, you may have tried these, and they, they sort of go out and then they come on again. And the history of the Christian churches has been like those birthday cake candles that you can't blow out, no matter how hard you try. Because our king rules forever. He stands behind us and above us. So how can one man, Jesus, be in himself the fulfillment of these ancient promises? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us that at this point in the gospel, but he is whetting our appetite because the rest of his gospel will tell us how it is possible for Jesus to bring about blessing for the whole world and for people all over the world to come to know God through him and how it's possible for this one man to be the king of God's people forever. And one of the things that Matthew loves to do is that again and again and again, he links Jesus to the Old Testament and shows us how he fulfills it. He's wanting again and again to say he's more than a carpenter. He's more even than a worker of miracles or an amazing teacher. He is the promised king, the promised offspring of Abraham through whom blessing is coming to the world. Do you know, it's an amazing theme, this. I think when I first became a Christian, I had no idea about it. I think I'd simply seen uh, the fact that there's evidence enough for Jesus in his own life, his uh, amazing teaching, his miracles, his resurrection from the dead, his willingness to go to a Roman cross for me. All that was explained to me. That was enough to make me a Christian. But over the years that followed, and I started reading the Old Testament, the three quarters of the Bible, which is the same as the, uh, the Jewish Bible used to this day in the synagogues, as I started to read that, I began to see this overarching theme, pointing forward to Jesus from thousands of years beforehand. And in fact, I, I think I can say that every year since I became a Christian, and particularly in the job of being a minister, where my job is to preach the Bible, I find new links, and they never, ever stop amazing me. He's far more than a carpenter. He's the fulfillment of God's plan. Handel's Messiah. Some of you are culture vultures and enjoy that great piece of music. Um, it tends to get performed most often, I suppose, at Christmas, sometimes at Easter. And I think for me, apart from the music, the, most, the single most amazing thing about that is it tells the story of Jesus mainly from the Old Testament, not from the New. It has some bits from the Gospels, but it's mainly from the Old Testament, mainly from the bits which come before Jesus was even born. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, in fact. And Matthew is going to go on showing us again and again how Jesus fits in with the Old Testament and, in fact, how that is also powerful evidence for who Jesus is. So this dry and dusty genealogy is actually showing us that Jesus is much bigger than we might have thought. And, and it's showing us, and this is such an encouragement, it's showing us the faithfulness of God. It shows us that the God of the Bible keeps the promises which he makes. That's what faithfulness means in the Bible. The faithfulness of God means that God will keep the promises he makes. How extraordinary it must have been for Abraham as he made his way home after hearing those promises of God 4,000 years ago. Uh, he, 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 he had no idea how this was going to work out. He couldn't have visualized us sitting here today in fulfillment of it. And yet God has been faithful. How amazing it must have been for David after he'd met with the prophet Nathan and heard these promises that God had, this great promise that God had made him that his line would last forever. He knew a bit about history. He knew the comings and goings of royal lines. How can the line that God is bringing from me possibly last forever? He couldn't have looked forward today, 3,000 years after his life, to see churches all over the world being held firm by their indestructible king who comes in his line. God's faithfulness matters to you and me. If we're Christians today, we're living by trust in God's promises. God's promises about a glorious future that he has for us. And sometimes through all the ups and downs of life and the difficulties of which there have been spades this year, we can wonder how it's all gonna come about. 
Well, read this genealogy. Read the Old Testament and see how it points forward to Jesus and take courage from God's track record of faithfulness for trusting his promises for you and me for the future. Let's pray together and thank God for these things. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Thank you for your faithfulness to your promises and that we can trust you to be faithful in your promises to us too. Thank you for the extraordinary way in which the Old Testament written centuries before Jesus points forward to him. Thank you for the way you used him to fulfill your promises. Help us to put all these pieces together in our minds, we pray, as we read Matthew's gospel in the coming weeks. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, what a wonderful, faithful God we have who has kept all of his promises throughout history in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our response is to trust him. And our final song will help us do that. It encourages us to walk, uh, to live by faith this week in God's promises.
children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith. Well, that brings us to the end of our service uh, this morning. Uh, before a final prayer, can I remind you about uh, After Church Coffee? If you're at home, uh, do log on to that, afterchurchcoffee.com. Um, it will take you to a Zoom meeting, and you can meet uh, other members of the church family and uh, share fellowship uh, together, encourage one another from what we've heard. Uh, I'll speak to us here in the building a little bit about uh, being able to meet and, and fellowship uh, in a moment as well. Before that, uh, let's pray together. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Father, we thank you for all of the promises you have made through history, for the promises to Abraham to bring blessing to the nations, for the promises to David to have an everlasting king. We thank you for how you have kept every single one of your promises in Jesus. For through him uh, comes blessing and that he is that everlasting king, the one who rules with you now and forever. And so please help us to keep trusting you. Please help us this week to walk by faith in you, in your son, submitting to your king's rule and looking forward to that day when he will return and bring his reign in in all its fullness. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next week. Our Father everlasting, the old creation.